Uh, by way of introduction, Dr. Gov Allen is a member of the Department of Information Systems. You know, I've been here for seven or eight years, 13 years. Oh, that was, that was, that was, that was, <laughs> It's 2007. 2007. Uh, before that, you were at Tulane, and uh, you worked there for a number of years. In fact, you were there during Katrina. Yeah. You didn't get into that period, but uh, you experienced it. We just got into it, yes. Yeah. So we were flooded out by Katrina. We were flooded out by Katrina. That's what got me to be one. Um, and you've been doing some interesting work on uh, Excel education and uh, the programming that goes in tracking um, the students. And, and some interesting instructional implications. So, um, for that short introduction, thank you. I will let you add anything else you want, and then we finish your team. I've known John for about a week, you know, so I thought that was a pretty good introduction. I had no idea what he could possibly say about me, and I was thrilled to remember that I used to live in New Orleans. Okay, so uh, let me introduce to you Professor Nick Ball, who's my colleague. In fact, he's across the hall from me, and then next door to me is Professor Conan Albrecht. They're both involved with the effort we'll be talking about today. Let me give you an idea for the, uh, the vision that I'm going to pitch to you. What we've created um, is really something that can be leveraged as a platform for doing research, uh, a kind of long-term, maybe large-scale research. I think we will have the ability to support multiple different kind of interesting research questions that we can answer that could throw off numerous papers. We've got the technology in place to do this, and we think that you folks have the research questions uh, that need to be answered, that we can't answer with this technology. And so the hope for this presentation is to show you what we have and begin a conversation about what the interesting research questions are in this area. So. Really, what we have is really two main components. One is we have a fully featured learning management system that we have the ability to manipulate in any way. The author of that system is Dr. Albrecht. And so, you know, when we say to him, Conan, we need this feature, he'll say, Great, you know, I won't be able to get to it right away. You probably won't have it till next Wednesday. And so, in terms of being able to implement something, what's really interesting about that is that this, this endeavor that you're seeing here, number one, it's a for-profit endeavor, and so we're, this is stuff that we're selling, and we have students at multiple universities currently using. But number two, all the principals in this concern uh, are research faculty. And so, not only do we have the capability to put in experimental treatments into the interface, we've got the motivation and the desire to do it. So if there's you know, any question that you think, man, if we could just tweak, put in this feature, this interesting design that we think there's a theoretical reason for why it would produce a different outcome in students, if we only had a way to, to test it, we've got thousands upon thousands of students who we can convert into subjects like that, and we've got the platform that we can use to, that we can use to implement, implement those experimental treatments. The second half of what we have here uh, stems from what John mentioned, the, uh, the training that we're doing in Microsoft Excel. And what this will give us, what we will see the details here, but at a high level, it gives us the ability, the ability to have a very uh, precise look at how students go about solving particular kinds of problems. And so uh, even to where uh, you'll see that we can infer, in some cases with a pretty high degree of regularity, what's happening inside the student's mind as they make a particular move in solving a particular problem. And so we think that that can give us really some interesting things in, in, uh, in terms of putting interventions that might help to correct uh, errors in a particular mental model that a student is trying to use to solve a problem that's taking them down the wrong road. Okay, so uh, to do that, I think what I'm going to do first is um, have Professor Ball just kind of take us a little bit through the learning management system. So. Professor Ball is uh, actually currently has a research, uh, kind of joint research with Randy, that uh, looks something about looks at some of the stuff that we've done here, and I think it's kind of one way to think of what's a, what's one possibility of research in this area. So, Nick, if you would just take a couple minutes and talk about that research, mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of show us some of the the basics of learning management system, 
We don't want to go into too much detail, but just so they get a feeling, this is a regular learning management system. Okay, great. So I, I guess I'm the testimonial part of the presentation today. Randy and I have been working on a project for about a year. Right? It was about this time last year. Um, the, the genesis of that project was I was handed this Excel class uh, to take over as we had a faculty member retire. We push about 2,500 students a year through this Excel class. And uh, I was basically told, take the class and fix it. Now, the reason why the class was broken was we were relying on um, a tool that simulates the Excel environment in a web browser. So students would point their browser to a website, very sophisticated simulation where the students would go to the site, would look and feel just like Microsoft Excel. They would complete um, exercises in the simulation, and the simulation would essentially track the students' uh, progress as they would complete the assignment, really essentially logging keystrokes. Uh, now, we were using that approach before because we just didn't have the resources to grade assignments by hand. We had to have some sort of automated grading. Um, don't really want to get into the details of the simulation unless the presentation takes us there, but there were some real limitations of the simulation, and I was essentially told, get us out of that simulated environment. But, oh, by the way, you can't do it with any more resources. We can't throw any more resources at this class. So I, I talked to Gov, we developed uh, the grading system that we'll show here later on, but essentially led to a different mode for teaching the class. So we went from relying on the simulation that had essentially animations that walk students through the process of cleaning, completing assignments to a, a system where we had a textbook, a tutorialized textbook that students would, would, would read. We produced a series of instructional videos that the students could watch while they were um, working through the activities, pre preparing them for the assessment part of the class. And then we developed a grading engine that allowed students to work on these assignments in the live application. And then we would get automated scoring with immediate and detailed feedback back to the students. So we, we uh, talked to Randy and said, can you, can you help us uh, determine whether our approach is at least as good as the simulation approach in terms of student performance? and student satisfaction with, with the learning environment. And oh, by the way, we'd like to get an academic publication out of this, and we know nothing about the literature or the theory that would be brought to bear um, in studying this. So Randy um, accepted our invitation to be part of the project. Happy to report that, would you say we've got a conditional acceptance at um, E, T, R, and D. I think I got the, the acronym right. So um, just in a year's time, we've turn a project into uh, a top tier, tier one a journal acceptance. Um, learning management system probably would be more appropriate for Connor to talk about since he developed it, but just give you some idea. I'm afraid he won't know how to stop if he starts talking. <laughs> okay. Can I just say one thing? I'm not going to say much during this presentation because it's really about their product, not mine. Uh, I just want to diffuse the whole learning man the, the learning suite thing. We're not competing with learning suites. There, there's a whole company behind this that I'm a, a partner in, that well, an investor in, I guess, that that we publish a number of online textbooks that combine video and, and uh, assignments all integrated together, and the existing learning management systems, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, all of those, they, they just weren't appro appropriate for what we were doing. So really, this, this came out of a whole different set of goals. We did our own. We're not pushing it on BYU or anybody else, that it's really meant to sell textbooks. But their product saw that and said, we can use this platform to jump from and, and use that as the back end for the rest of it. So I'll turn it, I, I won't say much more. Okay. I just wanted to say we're not, don't think we're trying to compete with BYU or anybody else here. It's, it's not the goal of this product. And, and really the goal, I guess, for this part of the presentation is just to point out that this, this is a full-blown learning management system. This is the landing page the students uh, arrive at when they uh, click on a link to go to a specific class that utilizes the learning management system. Uh, very typical stuff. We've got contact information, information about what's coming up in the class or what's passed in the class. Um, we've got a place here where students can view announcements, get direct access to the electronic textbook for the class, including the instructional videos that I talked about. Uh, the progress bar across the top is just a way to graphically depict to the students where they are 
versus you know completing the class. Um, really, just a, a, the dashboard view of the learning management system. From there, students can click on a link to uh, go to course information. I'll skip activities for just a second. This is just the traditional class syllabus. Um, also has information. I don't think I've got it in this one because I don't have a class schedule. Maybe I do. I don't. So this is also where students will go to see the detail about the class schedule, you know, information about lectures, when assignments are due, um, there are direct links to assignments from, from the schedule, um, a way for them to download and populate an external calendar if they want to. Uh, we have information about the activities that they need to complete for the class. This is the graded activities. For our Excel stuff, essentially what that means is students will click on a link get some instruction about how to complete the assignment, have direct links to the electronic textbook and videos um, that, that are the, the basis for the assignment, and this is also where they would download the file that, that really is the assessment part of that unit of the class. Um, there are, this is a fully featured activity section where you can create quizzes, essay quizzes, multiple choice, choice quizzes, um, what else? I mean, you, you've thrown a, a lot at all. They, they can come submit things auto grade. They can look at their grade. There's a grading engine for the TH or the professor to be able to grade very quickly without downloading files. It's preview windows and all so that. So you can upload thing. files to the site. It's pretty traditional pretty stuff, but it's but it's also fully featured. So there's there's not something glaring here that you'd say, oh well, it really doesn't have that. Someone could adopt the learning management mm -hmm. system uh, just to support their class, even if they're not purchasing one of the electronic textbooks. And then the last thing I wanted to show up here is just the grade book, just a traditional grade book for the student. They can see the list of activities, points they've earned, percentage, how it's rated in the class. Again, it's a fully featured LMS. I think that's probably all you want to read up there, right? Exactly. Thank you. Just one question to you. Yeah. What, what tool did you use to build this? It's all written in Python uh, with the Django framework, if that means anything. It's fairly custom from, from the ground up. Got it. It's not built on any particular like WordPress or anything like that. And I guess I should say one other thing. This is the back, the back, uh, the the back end for our assignment. So students will complete an assignment in Excel. They'll submit the assignment through the Excel workbook, and everything is posted automatically through through uh, this this back end. That so. There's no manual uploading of scores. It's integrated well with our product. Yeah. Which do the students never see the, the, the any of these screens, like the LMS itself? So the students go to the LMS to access the textbook, to access the assignments, and to view their grades. So yeah, in fact, you know, this is kind of what one of these electronic textbooks looks like. So that's one area that may be area for research that you folks, that someone in this department might be interested in. Well, so, so this this is uh, changeable. This is authorable. I could, I oh, could yeah. make a lesson that was way different from this one. Absolutely right. If you've got a textbook, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> go to the, just show them one thing for me. Go, go okay. to the study tab and turn on the comments and the highlighting there. So if you turn on comments, notice the screen just split. And if you come back out, you can just click on the sidebar there and add comments. You can share comments with the rest of the class, share, you know, kind of have a group session of comments. I want to add features to this, like, what does it mean to follow your friends in the textbook? What does it mean to share experiences within the textbook beyond just commenting and highlighting? So if any of you have interest in that kind of thing, I'd, I'd be interested to talk to you about it. So, yeah. Much of what's happened in the electronic textbook area has been to take existing textbooks and essentially take a printed book and now put it, render it into this medium without really taking advantages of the, of the, the benefits that the platform offers. So being able to write a note in your textbook that you could then share from someone else or that you would consume, if there's some brilliant kid in the class and he's making notes in the textbook, if I could somehow get access to those, either He's giving them to me out of the goodness of his heart, or there's some marketplace that those kinds of notes are exchanged. Those are, I think, tremendous research questions around those kinds of manipulations that should be happening in textbooks that simply aren't happening. Another one that we want to do that, that would be really fun is, is to let students rewrite sections of the book. So if a student comes in and says, the author just really flubbed up this section, 
I'm going to rewrite it for him or her. And, and then you could come to any given section and say, I want to see the original or these two or three other versions of this, or addendums to this, or something. And it would be, it's, it's not Wikipedia, but it would be a group type experience versus just what the author gives. So question, lots of options. And there's there's things you could do with this. So, so is the idea that the students pay for the reader? Get the reader or get the reader free, or is the is they, they pay for the textbook. They so for, for a given book. class, all of our textbooks are well, most of them, the top price is sixty nine dollars. Mm -hmm. So the real one of the main reasons we we started this whole business was I'm tired of two hundred dollar textbooks and charging most of my students. I I have the, the number one selling fraud textbook in the world. And I get very little money off of it as an author, and it's two hundred and seventy dollars now for students. That's just wrong in, a, in an age where this is almost free to give give out. So that the goal is to decrease costs of textbooks and pay authors more, and and add all the benefits we can do with this platform. Not just put what a lot of publishers are doing is just putting a box on the screen and you turn the page just like you would in the old days, and that that doesn't make sense. This is just HTML. It's a page like you'd read on the web. You can view it wherever you want. So I, I don't want to take up the presentation, but there's a question. A lot of options here. Oh, just like I was wondering for like the idea you had, like those are only viewable from like people you know or like in your group. Like these. We haven't or... cracked that nut yet. What what does that mean to share with the world versus your class versus? I, I don't know. Those are all questions we need to answer. So, so part of what I was trying to get at is. Um, Current ebook readers right now, they're uh, they're really distribution mechanisms for like companies who want to sell their textbooks, mm -hmm. but they're they don't have necessarily an open standard which would allow someone like like let's say I purchased a textbook as an instructor and put it in here, but let's say I also wanted to I had these PDFs of content that I created myself, and I want to stick them in here and use the functionality of your system to be able to do that. Do I Actually, then have to, can I just do that, or do I have to somehow enter into a contract with you in order to be able to stick my content in and use the functionality of markup and all of that to, to, to have success? We've played with a couple of models on that. Right now, what we've scaled back to, we tried a few fun things, and we're open. I mean, it's a new company. But right now, the people that are putting their textbooks on here are entering into a contract, and we, we, we take their PDFs or InDesign or whatever it is and convert it over to DocBook, which is what this is. So you you'd need to be an author at this point. But if you've got ideas, talk to me. It's especially if there's a research question behind it, that we could say, let's set up a study and look at it other questions about adoption or I don't know what other questions there could be to be asked about that, but that's really the idea we're pitching here is come to come to some of your research questions, let's work together on a collaborative uh, paper to do some interesting research. Okay, so what I want to show you now is what we can do kind of at the individual level. So what are we able to, to handle when a student is working on a particular assignment? And so what we'll show you is uh, really just an assignment that is an introduction to a Microsoft Excel assignment. But this technology that we're doing, we can push easily into any of the Microsoft products. So if someone's doing something in Word and we want to keep track of what's going while they're working in Word, uh, we currently actually have an implementation of this in Microsoft Access because Excel and Access are the products that we live and breathe over in the Information Systems Department. But we can really go into other products with this. A student would just download a file and then I have already opened this file here. It then is just a Microsoft Excel workbook. One difference here is that built into this workbook is a custom tab. So here's your normal home tab. But we have a tab in the ribbon that's just a set of tools that we use for manipulating this assignment. So the student says, I'm interested in seeing the detailed instructions for this assignment. So they just click on the instruction sheet button. And that opens up the instructions, description of the, the instructions in a browser. As it turns out, it's not making a round trip to the web. You'll notice that this is a local file. So that workbook creates a local HTML document 
and then displays it in the system's default browser. And so we've got you know, some overall assignments for, or overall instructions for the assignment. Then for this particular set of tasks, there's a context that's given for this task, task and then there's the detailed instructions. So the first thing we're asking these introduction, these introduction level students to do is to calculate the total exam score in cell E9, or the student in row 9 by adding the midterm score in C9 and, whatever, and D9. This, is, this ends up being a substantial cognitive task for the student to look at this instruction and to map all of these different uh, facts into the Excel workbook that they're working on. It is a non-trivial task. If you've ever had to pick up somebody else's workbook and make sense of it and then be able to work in it, you, you know that it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So that's all this cognitive effort. It's cognitive load that is, that is not germane to the task that they're trying to accomplish, which is either learn a particular thing about Excel or demonstrate that they can do a particular thing about Excel. So that's this non-germane cognitive load is a cognitive burden that we would really like to reduce because its effort is, it has the same cost to the student as the germane cognitive load, but it has absolutely no benefit in terms of the task at hand. And so uh, we said, look, it would be great if we had some way to, instead of just showing this in a separate document, that we could say, we want to see these tasks one at a time. And so that's what this task guide is. It's just a window that's integrated into Microsoft Excel that shows one task at a time. And you'll notice that as I navigate and go from task to task, we're highlighting the relevant cells in the workbook for that particular task. So we're helping the student to map from the question down into the worksheet of to, to be able to you know, set up what they need. So this particular question is going to deal with these two cells and this table of cells, and we've indicated that to the student. So you know, this is one thing that uh, we did it because we just wanted our students to be able to have more access, to be able to get at the, at the information more quickly and easily. But we're certain that there's some interesting question about uh, how does this improve performance uh, overall. Part of the reason why we did it was practical, too. We would find students would answer the question correctly, but for whatever reason, put it in the wrong place. And so then that, you know, was a challenge to our grading system. And this gives a solution to that. Yeah. yeah. Did you just use some kind of markup for the instructions up there? Because right? it's integrating, you know, selecting the correct cells and stuff. Or how do you do that? So this is this whole system that we're seeing here is written in VBA, which is the programming language that's built into Microsoft Excel. And so this is just a VBA, what they call a user form in that context. And so this assignment here is rendered inside the workbook as a set of objects that we can then read the information off those objects, display it as an HTML document, or we read the same objects to put the information here. We read the same object structure when it comes time to grade the assignment. I'm just talking about like when you're actually trying to make it. Like, so imagine I have my own Excel assignment. I want to make this step by step. Like, how would I integrate the, the Okay. That was with that Excel. So as it turns out, we have a tool that's designed just for authoring these kinds of assignments. And so you'd say, I'm making a new task. Here's the name of the task, and here's the text of the task. You'd then say, I want to highlight the cells that should be highlighted when this is the active task, and then you indicate that in the workbook. And then the tool remembers that, builds the objects, and then they become part of the workbook. Yeah. So the, at this point, they're working within a, a live spreadsheet that's situation. That's right. Yeah. All it takes okay. is they've got to have Microsoft Excel installed and they have to have this workbook downloaded and they're ready to go. And this is the live application. This is this is not a simulation. Oh, okay. So we are in Excel. This Real is thing. This is just Excel. And that's what really sets this apart from everything else out there in the market right now, from a marketing perspective. Okay, so so how do you make a response now? And okay, yeah, let's go ahead. What does it, it, what does it so do? So the students would say, okay, I'm doing this. But I just said, look, add up these cells. So we say, great, I'm going to take this cell plus this cell. And that's my answer. now. As my students will attest, I'm not the best typist, and the plus key and the minus key are right next to each other. So instead of adding these two together, I subtract them. But in terms of what I was really trying to accomplish here, I'm really close. I'm putting the value in the right cell, I'm referencing the right cells, I've got an arithmetic operator between them, it's just the wrong one. And so I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Now, if I'm really thinking about this problem, I'm going to think that should be the sum of these two numbers, and that really isn't the sum, something's gone wrong. But for now, I'm just going to pretend that I can see that. <coughs> Next, one, one of the frustrations we had with the simulation was simulation at this point <coughs> would stop the student, say, you made a mistake, and have them look through, you know, a, a minute or two worth of remedial animations for fixing the, the mistake. 
this, the live application doesn't do that for you. The live application allows you to make that mistake and doesn't say anything about it, right? So this is really more realistic than, than the simulation. So let's say they would have, instead of putting cell plus cell, they put in, they used the, the sum uh, function. Sure. So the, the question is, what if they use sum instead of adding it together? In this case, we don't really care how they, how they did this. So we're not specifically saying, look, we want you to see two cells and an arithmetic operator between them. So if they did that to come up with the right answer, they would get full credit. Now, if they just typed in, uh, what would that be, 176, if they just typed the answer in there, they'd have the right answer, but they wouldn't have the right underlying function. They'd get partial credit for coming up with the right answer, but, and we'd give them detailed feedback, and you'll see that here in just a minute. So how do you distinguish between like sum and the plus? Or is it, that this all works? I'll show you that. that. I'll show you that. Can I just add here too? When we were doing this uh, research, I can't tell you how many times I got emails from the group that was doing the um, simulation, and they were frustrated because they were saying, "I got the right answer, but I got <coughs> it, it wrong. You know, I did it well. I did it differently than they did it." And they were just really frustrated with that. Yeah, and that's characteristic of the experience that we were trying to get away from. So the next assignment, uh, the next test is, hey, look, just copy E9 down. And so we'll copy that one. That's pretty simple. So in fact, now this for this task, every single one of these answers is wrong. But I did exactly what, they, what that task said, which was just copy that value down. So we'll see that when we get to the, the grading portion. Of the now this actually addresses the question that you had. Here we're saying specifically, look, we want to make sure you know how to use the sum function. So the direction says use the sum function to add up all these homework scores. Question. So, I mean, I've done similar things like this and struggled with being able to look an artifact after the fact and determine if our students are really doing it correctly or, and one of the issues is whether they're doing it efficiently or not, right? So, mm -hmm. when you ask to copy down, I mean, one thing they could do is they could go in and type in every cell the same formula, yep. but that's not really testing the skill that we want them to have. What we want to see is that they can do the, the, the function copy. So it turns out we can tell whether they went and, and did that formula. Even if they just said, you know, I'm going to copy and paste it one cell at a time. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Or if they typed it in one cell at a time. We, we can, can tell, tell between that. that. And if they said, you know what, it's a one function. Copy this and paste it across this range. Okay. And you'll, I'm That's going to cool. show you how we, yeah. how we have the ability to look at that here. Okay, so this one says, look, we're trying to sum up all these homework scores. Now, if it's my mother doing this, she's going she's gonna to say, oh, I don't want to do that. This equal, this, oops, this. No, I bet your mom got it. Be nice. <laughs> oh, she's a nice lady. <laughs> she's just not so good with Excel. She'd come in here and say equals, and she'd just, I just want to add these up. And so, in this case, we're going to come up with the correct answer, but the task is specific. This is my big task. The task has, oh, use the sum function again. The task specifically tells us to use the sum function. And so this is really just the opposite of what I did here. I did, I got the right answer, I just didn't go about it the way that was part of a requirement of the task. And we'll just do a couple more things here and then we'll take a look at how, uh, how the scoring is handled here. So in this case, for the total score, we're just going to uh, make this equal to the total of the homework plus the total of the exams. Now in this case, everything about this particular formula is correct, but it's relying on a reference cell that has an improper value. So the answer is wrong, and yet the student did everything right, right here. Similarly here, this, and we're not going through the instructions because I've memorized this particular assignment. The student would be going task by task. Here we're taking that total score, and we're dividing it by the total points in the class, and here we're just checking to make sure that these students know how to fix a cell. So when this copies down, we want to make sure that they've got dollar signs in here so that it keeps that reference to this location. Last one, I'm going to go ahead and do the VLOOKUP function, which is the bane of our students' existence. I'm going to do VLOOKUP. Uh, generally, how comfortable are people with Excel in this class? You say, you know what? If you say, I'm, I feel pretty comfortable with Excel, just raise your hand so I can see things are not half the throw The other half of you should buy the textbook. Okay. <laughs> so VLOOKUP, we're going to do a vertical lookup, we're going to take this value, we're going to look it up in this table, 
we are going to ask to bring back the second column out of that table, and we want it to be an approximate match. And so that's the correct formula. Poor student is failing the class. And then I'll copy these values down. Everyone's failing. Well, it's because I subtracted their exam scores. And that, that's one of the big problems that we have anytime we're doing, the whole, the whole purpose of doing a spreadsheet like this is to be able to have a value somewhere and change that value and have it reflect its change throughout the whole set of calculations. Well, that, that's a great thing, and that's why we do this. But the problem is, if they make an error up in the upper left-hand corner, that error will propagate throughout the whole thing. And so that was also a challenge that we had to figure out a way to deal with. Let me just make sure one thing. This is the middle of the course somewhere, right? This is not like lesson one. This was, this particular assessment was the pre-test and the post-test that we used in the research study that ran behind. Okay, so I, I just wanted to, this, that was my comfort question. Oh, <laughs> this is not, yeah, so the, so the VLOOKUP is not day one. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was hoping. <laughs> It's funny because we were showing this to a finance professor, some guy who lives and breathes in Excel, and, and he made the comment, oh yeah, I forget the look of every time. In fact, usually I just go do it by hand instead of looking at it. Which was really shocking because he uses Excel a lot. But, and there's other kind of interesting questions around base rate, um, base rate of use. So, so I think we have a, a, a mechanism that can allow us to examine some of those things, even though we're not specifically treating that particular. All right, so the student then says, okay, I'm ready to submit this workbook, and there's a submit button right here. Now, because we're in control of what's going on, we've got code running right now in this workbook. It's kind of watching over what the student's doing. When they hit submit, we have a fabulous luxury, and that is we can, we can put up a little message that says, look, slow down, cowboy. You just tried to submit this, but before you did, the system made a few checks and found the following issues. A complete assignment is going to have a pie chart. And there's no chart in this workbook at all. We're signaling to that student, if you proceed and submit, it lose all the points associated with that. There's actually three sheets here, and we went on to say, it looks like you haven't finished all the tasks in the gradebook worksheet, or we haven't even touched the other, we didn't even start those. And it says, are you sure you want to submit, is essentially what we're saying. And we're giving them some reason to, to consider, are they really sure? This, it turns out that the reason we put this in place was because one of the big things that we spend time with our students on is, the student comes in and says, I, Professor Allen, I don't know how it happened. I submitted the wrong workbook. I had the whole thing done, and I submitted one that was only halfway done. Can't you please evaluate the one that I should have submitted? Some of the times, I think that's the truth. And some of the times, I don't think it's the truth. And so now, that's a question we don't deal with. I don't, actually, you dealt with it once. Yeah, so the last two semesters, I taught uh, 900 students last semester. Didn't get that excuse once. Already this semester, of course, I have about 1,200 students this semester. Did get it once. The student had to me say, I submitted the wrong assignment. They said, so when the window came up and said to you, are you sure that you want to submit because there's this problem, this problem, this problem, why did you say yes? And it kind of short, I did it nicely, but short, short circuited that, that question. So the student says yes, we say, okay, we need to authenticate you. So we enter the username and the password and we can submit. Now, what happens here is that the workbook now grades itself. So all the logic that's required to evaluate this workbook, that happens. The report for that assignment is then sent back to our server. Our server sends back a result that says, hey, I've recorded the, the response. We say, great, now it sends up the workbook. So the instructor has a copy of the workbook that the student just did. Uh, and then once that is complete, it displays the result to the student. Next question here. Um. And so what the student gets now is their score, which looks pretty much like their assignment, except that now instead of just showing the points, we're showing how many points did you achieve out of the nine that were possible there. <coughs> and when you've got less than full credit, we explain to the student why. So here's the, the instruction. We say, look, you lost four points because you didn't come up with the right answer. Here's where we copied that value there down. It was only worth one point, but I got full credit for that, even though every single formula is wrong. The fact is, it's wrong in exactly the same way, so we know that they copied that value down. Yeah, so task one there was the one where Gov subtracted the exam scores. So had the right references, had the, uh, an operator, so kind of the right format, two references with an operator between them, had the wrong operator, so they lost a substantial number of points for not having the right value, but also got a substantial number of points for doing much of the problem. 
we got to the sum function. I didn't use the sum function, but I came up with the right, referenced the right cells, came up with the right answer, and so I got six out of nine points. I just missed the three for not actually using the sum function. The rest of these, then, that actually now rely on the incorrect data from task number one, they come up with full credit, because what I did there was right, even though the ending result wasn't exactly right. And the reason that we're able to do this is because we're able to recalibrate the rubric at the point where each rule is evaluated. So we say we're going to look at this rule. What should the answer to this, what should the value in this cell be, given the way the worksheet is currently configured? And then we check to see if that's exactly you know, the answer that we come up with. And that. The other products out there cascade errors all the way through as one thing refers to another. And th this is really useful to be able to pinpoint exactly where the student messed up, what their thinking was, what they were doing at the time, to, to the problem area and not all over the place. And so down to the part of the assignment where I haven't done anything, we then see I've just got you know, lots of rules that we're using to give partial credit, and I've received none of those. And so I see exactly why I haven't done it. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so I, I know we wouldn't, we don't have students that would cheat at BYU, but we hope we wouldn't. I know we do, but some. But um, on the Tanner Building, just, just <laughs> <laughs> I can tell stories. But I did, I, I'm We're doing research in that area. Yeah. I hope I can tell stories. This is a document. Do you are, are you able to randomize things within your assessment in a way that allows you to maintain the same script for grading, but? Changes other aspects that 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 would allow you to know, give a unique uh, assessment to each student. We are able to do that, um, and we've talked seriously about implementing that. We haven't done it because when a professor talks about the assignment, it's nice for students to be able to see the, the values that we're talking about. But I'm going to be able to resolve that concern that you have uh, when I get to the grade book that's associated with this particular assignment, and that's coming up. We've got uh, less than ten minutes, and so uh, I will show that here. I'll show that right now. From the student's perspective, this is what they see. If, as a professor, all I'm interested in is seeing, I want to be able to see the report that the student got, and I want to be able to see the score that the student had, then I can do that directly in the LMS. So the learning management system that's online, I can just go online and, and see that information. But if I want to have more detailed analytics, then I have a workbook, another Excel workbook, that is tied directly to this assignment. And that's a grade book. So it's, again, it's just an Excel workbook. We now have a tab dedicated to running this workbook. The professor says, great, I've got this workbook. I want to download my students' submissions. Clicks the download all button. It interacts with the LMS in the back end and brings in summary information about the student's performance. Some of the stuff you'd expect, name, email address, points possible, points earned. I'm going to come back to the score code in a minute. It helps us resolve the, the question that came in the back. As does this. What we have here is a user ID. This is a unique identifier for Mark Harvey, the person who uploaded this document. Now, it doesn't look like it when the student downloads it. When the student downloads the workbook, it just looks like they're following the link to an Excel workbook. But as the server downloads that file, it cracks that workbook open and it injects that student's unique identifier into that workbook. So every single workbook that gets downloaded is different. Uh, and it's customized to that student. We know who downloaded the file. This is one of the reasons why we couldn't rely on an existing LMS to do this, because that's not normal functionality. This accountability ID is the, is the identifier that we found in the workbook that was uploaded. And we expect those two to be the same. And when they are, we don't do anything special. But when they're different, we highlight the number here. So looking here, we see Mary uh, uploaded a workbook that had a different identifier than the one she downloaded. That in itself is not necessarily indicative of academic uh, in misconduct. Uh, it could have been that the person she copied it from had just downloaded a blank workbook and said, here you go. I, 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 no reason for you to download it, I just downloaded it. In fact, anytime we highlight a number here, we also highlight it here just to make it easier to find who's the person who downloaded that workbook. So we can see that Sherry's the one that downloaded it, Mary and Sherry both uploaded the same workbook. Now, we keep track of how many steps it takes the student to complete the assignment. So in this case, a, a step is a change to a cell or a range of a cell. And so we can see that it took Mary 44 distinct moves to be able to solve this problem. And for Sherry, the same. So that is a little bit more information, but not necessarily a smoking gun. If only we could see what those 44 steps were. Oh, yes, we can. 
So with those two cells highlighted, I can say, look, I want to see the log for these particular students. We capture the date and the time, the sheet they're working on, the cell they're modifying, the formula that they put into that cell, and the value that's displayed when they, at that moment in the workbook. And we've got these two logs now side by side. And you know, I just kind of look at the formulas that are put in, I can see this looks pretty suspicious. But if I have any more questions, I can go and look at the timestamps. It's down to the second. Did this happen? And in fact, what we have here now is conclusive evidence that this was a single workbook that was uploaded by two, by two different students. We have other things happening here, too. Um, well, there's another thing that will go, and there's a lot of questions we could ask about just by looking at that log. That full log is up there of their whole actions through the workbook. There's a lot of things we could do just what they how they peruse this thing, where did they go? And right, so what we like see that. here is step by step, how, how did this student solve this problem? First thing they did, second thing they did. And this actually gets to the question that happened here. Here what we see is a cell was changed, and here is one step where a whole range of cells was changed. So this is a paste across multiple ranges. Is this itself a spreadsheet? So the question is, is this itself a spreadsheet? And the answer is no, this right here is just uh, an HTML, HTML log, HTML. however, if I want to see it in a spreadsheet, I just say, look, I want to import those, I want to import those worksheets into Excel, or those logs into Excel, and then I have it as a spreadsheet. So, so I could take a, a little expert system program, and I could look at the specific set of steps, and I could, I could find a way to provide some intelligent feedback. Yeah. Right, let's go. I wasn't headed there next, but let me go ahead and show that to you. It's possible for me to say, look, I don't want to just see one person's log. I want to bring in the raw data for all the logs on this assignment. It takes a minute to bring it down, but now what I'm getting is, hopefully, what I'm getting is every, it's the log for all the students. So now I've got timestamp worksheet cell, but I now also have the identifier for that particular student. So what I'm seeing here is every step that Mark did, Mark's got, I don't know, 100 steps or so. We scroll down and get past Mark and we're on to the next student. Steps. Mark. Here's Elsie and Leroy. Now the interesting thing here is that when we download this, if a student has a syntax error at any time during the workbook, we highlight that in a different color. So we've just colored the background of this row differently. So I can say, you know what, I'm really only interested in seeing the errors that my students made along the way. Now, if all I was looking at is the workbook they upload at the end, I won't see these errors because they fixed them along the way. But now I'm, what I'm seeing is they're intermediate problems. So I can say, look, I just want to, I want to filter this by color. And now I'm only looking at the errors that my students have. I know that one of the places they struggle is the VLOOKUP. So I'm going to come in here and say, you know what, I only want to look at VLOOKUP. So I'll just apply a text filter here uh, and look for VLOOKUP. So now what I'm seeing is the errors that my students had while they were working with the VLOOKUP function. And so we can kind of say, why are my students struggling? In fact, the very first time we ever did this, we were looking at this particular data set, and we said, what did this guy have wrong here? Um, actually, that didn't, that didn't jump out to me what he had wrong here. But this one, he's supposed to bring back the second column from that table, and he puts Q, which is the column number. It's a reasonable thing to do. Bring back what's in column Q. We saw this one, and we were befuddled. This guy's got a 17 in there where it should be a 2. The columns, the table's two columns wide, P to Q. And we're saying, he's saying, bring back the 17th column out of his table. And he's, he tries a bunch of different things. Well, maybe I need that parameter at the end. Maybe i got to get rid of the dollar signs. Uh, change here. I don't see what he changed here. Oh, it went to false. Here, yeah. Maybe I'm going to go back and try something else. He spends over five minutes trying to, he said, maybe it's not 17, maybe it's 16. I don't even know what he's thinking about. I always thought, well, the guy's clueless. We have some students who are clueless, even in the business school. But we look down. Here's Liana. Same problem. 17. Here's Nathan. 17. What does that mean? Any thoughts? Where the 17 is coming from? Are we looking at the row? No. It's the column. Is it, is yeah, it a the number that's at the top of the side? It's column 17. Q yeah. is the column that holds the data. It is the second column in the table I'm referencing, but it's the 17th letter of the alphabet. And so he's thinking, I need the column number that has the data. And he's counting back from A over. It is a common mistake. So this is where I alluded to at the beginning. Because we have, because we're in control of what's happening at the, at the, when the student's on the workbook, as soon as a student gets on this problem and they put a 17 in there, 
we could say we could put a little icon, we could put a, an image right next to the cell he's working on that says, I have a thought for you. You can click on this thought if you want to. Okay, well, there's a thought. I looked at it. You know, we saw you put a 17 here. It's a pretty common mistake. What it means is, you're trying to think, count over column 17. But the column number reference only talks about the reference table here. So we can actually realize, aha, we know what's going wrong with the mental model that that student has at this point. And we can intermediate, or we can intervene at that point to remediate the student. And the um, so that's, we think it's a fabulous thing to do. Does it make the product more valuable? Probably. But it's a really interesting research question that, frankly, we don't have the right background to say, here's how to even talk about the question uh, in, a, in an intelligent way. So there are some other things that we can do here. In this case, what we see is we, have, we see two identifiers in the workbook that we looked at. What that means is he had his workbook open, and you know, he submitted his own workbook. That's what these two numbers are. These two numbers are the same. But he's got someone else's identifier in there. So it turns out he had his workbook open, and he had his buddy's workbook open, and he copied a cell from his buddies and pasted that cell into his. We can tell that that happened, and we can tell which workbook it came from <coughs> when that happened. So in terms of being able to tell when people are collaborating in an inappropriate way, we can do that. Last thing I'm going to show you, because I think we have a 10 cell. Even if I've got students who are working together, they're not doing any electronic collaboration. Two students are sitting side by side working on this problem. That's what the scorecard allows us to do. If I do what we refer to as a submission integrity analysis, what happens is that this workbook gets sorted by this particular code. Now what this code is, it's a six bit hash of the rule level performance of the student. Each rule, and there's something like 50 rules in this one, but each rule evaluates either true or false for that student. And so any two students that have exactly the same score code will have exactly the same score but it means they got that score in exactly the same way down to the individual rule level. So a task might have five, six, seven rules for it, and each one of those has a profile for how they perform on that task. So what we have here is we have two students who don't have any indication of electronic collaboration, otherwise there'd be some color here, but they've got exactly the same score code. Does this mean that they worked together? No, nope. they could have had two people that did exactly the same thing wrong, uh, exactly the same way. But remember, we have the log. And so we can go and we can see the log to see you know, were these two people doing this at approximately the same time. We can tell who the intellectual leader of the dyad is. Um, because one of those will lead the other. And so that's uh, kind of another interesting thing that we can do here. So in terms of people collaborating, we have a pretty good set of tools to figure out what that is. In fact, that gets to the heart of some of the research that we were doing at the time we were designing the system, was to say, you know, how can we intervene when people are violating a rule within a system, and uh, what are some uh, mechanisms that we can do to encourage them not to do that without being too overbearing. And that research is, is ongoing, and hopefully we'll be able to support that research by the system that we're going forward as well. So, excuse me, but does that mean that you send a little pop-up that says, excuse me, Evelyn, but it looks like you and Cassandra are perhaps being inappropriate? It is a, it, that's an empirical question of whether that's an appropriate thing to do, whether that's a, an effective um, countermeasure. So we could, that's something we could do, um, but we, the system currently does not do the system. Because initially, what we're interested in finding initially, what's the base rate? Before we try to intervene, what's the base rate of this kind of collaboration that's going on? And is that bad? If, I mean, two people are working on together and they say, well... It's a matter of course policy. Yeah. yeah. I can see some courses where that would be just fine. Absolutely. I know we've got to go, but just a quick question. Like, um, I mean, most of us are not Excel educators, so how hard would it be to integrate your platform essentially with like another program or even like a, like a web-based service? Yeah. So the, the first thing that, uh, the first low-hanging fruit that we would see here is, can we set up the assignment that we're trying to do so that it is, it's actually an assignment that is done in Excel or one of the other Microsoft products? We know that we can do some similar things, and we currently do do some similar things in query formulation, and that's a web interface, uh, as well as uh, in um, like Java programming, just writing Java programs. So those are other areas that we've pushed this technology. We don't have the same level of control as to be able to see step by step what's going on as we do. And really, Excel is the place that's probably the strongest of all the platforms for that. So if there's, a, if there's an interesting question, I think the right way to to explore that research question would be to say, how can we cast that in a context that we could examine uh, using Excel? Uh, but if it ends up that's not the right platform, it's possible, and, and we intend to take this technology into other platforms, and that's also possible. So, 
the platform does also have the ability to say, you know what, I just want to see overall how the students perform, so here's all the tasks, they're doing well at the front, not as well at the back. Question 12 looks like a problem. I can come back to here and say, you know what, I just want to look at question 12. Don't stop at the task level, but go down to the rule level and go back and look. And we can see why did the students perform poorly on that one. There were three rules here. You're supposed to use the average function, use a particular range, give a particular value. Everyone used the average function. They got the wrong value because they used the wrong range. So we can look in and find out exactly why are students struggling on a particular question. And that really is um, the the details of what we're currently able to do. So I want to, again, just kind of stress that we, we are the creators of this system from the, the, everything you've seen today, from the beginning to the end. And so we have both the ability and the inclination to make modifications to this system and to see how it affects the way that people learn. And so we're really hoping to open a dialogue about how we can collaborate on some meaningful research in this area. I guess we have some place that we go now for an informal discussion. Food, soup, downstairs. <laughs> involves food, so I like that. I like that. So, I guess that will be it, and we'll continue this informally in the next set.